Cansona, a parting on shipboard. A bright jeweled beetle, like a clump of fire, glowed at her throat as the sun went rolling out over my shoulder, while an incredible dark colony of garnets crowning her wrist fell as the deck heaved under us to shaking. Our hands touched, the bug blew in the wind and clung as if hanged by the nap of the wool she wore. Could I have found a better jewel to buy her than such an insect? It might have made a shout of its shining with every crystal syllable, to intimate such farewells from her breast as if to feign a sorrier forsaking than our impermanent parting, as she hung, clasped clinging to my neck, and cried and swore. No lapidary joy of gold and wire clasped both our brows so intricately about, but no mere sea grief swelled her eyes so full when I, uneasy lepidopterist, made light of the bug, when, as if by my making, five crystal tears splashed down her arm among the garnets and made them seem pismires all the more. Their antic sparkling composed our speech entire. Salt tears flashed within the stones. The sea without echoed our silence till one shrieking gull stooped of a sudden as if at an amethyst in the head of the beetle, and all its undertaking seemed aimed at that antic bug. Then the bird slung its body and its being toward the shore. Oh, bug, 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 that did require the quietest devotions of our doubt. At once a lump of crafted mineral whose crystals no reflection could resist, and a real beetle whose safety lay in faking the fixity of jewels, lest some toxin tongue enjoy its Janus facets to the core. Just then the wind blew up a little higher, inflaming the sunset, until there was no doubt but that departure was upon us. Still the whistle, the irritant bell, had to insist that the giving of gifts was done but for our breaking. A venomous toxin rolled, when it had rung, a swarm of June bees drew up in a roar. No longer then could she and I conspire about the bug, all bustling and devout, to make our delaying less discernible. A pair of antiquarians we kissed and clipped, then parted, querulous and quaking. I wished her joy of the bug, at which she flung her jewels to the sea to spawn upon its floor while in my hand remained five bright tears, wrung like tiny insects of sweat from every pore. Heat of Snow When she, laughing, plastered a snowball on me, all the crisp, white, sherbety cold we both were waiting for seemed suddenly to have melted. Somehow her shoulders fell against my own as the thing hit both of us at once, and then, as we fell together on the high, soft drift that the sun made bright, we burned, oh, we burned, but not because such sunlight was any warmer than the glaring ice on the pond beyond us, forcing us to squint as we sat and shivered later together when we thought how even inside the snow there blazed such warmth, how nothing was colder now than our informing flame. And if ice perhaps might cool it a little, then how painful, blinding, the prospect toward the shimmering pond, where, lifeless, the ice awaited first our shielded gaze, then our tired march and final arrival. A lion named Passion. Hungering on the gray plain of its birth for the completion of the sunny cages to hold all its unruly, stretching forth its longest streets and narrowest passages, the growing city 
paws the yielding earth and rears its controlling stones. Its snarl damages the dull, unruffled fabric of silences in which the world is wrapped. The day advances and shadows lengthen as their substances grow more erect and rigid, as low hearth and high stark tower rise beneath the glances of anxious ordered supervision. North bastion and eastern wall are joined and fences are finished between the areas of mirth and the long swords of mourning. Growth manages at once vigor of spurts and the rigor of stages. If not the just city, then the safe one. Sea and mountain torrent warded off and all the wildest monsters caged, that running free the most exposed and open children shall fear no consuming grasp. Thus the polity preserves its fast peace by the burial of those hot barbarous sparks whose fiery bright eruption might disturb blackness of night and temperateness of civil love. The light of day is light enough, calm, gray, easy, and agreeable. And beasts? The lion might be said to dwell here, but so tamed is he, set working in the streets, say, with no fright incurred by those huge paws which turn with glee a hydrant valve, while playing children sprawl and splash in the bright spray, dribbling a shiny ball. So innocent he is, his huge head high and chinny pointed over his shoulder, more a lion rampant blazoned on the sky than monster romping through the streets with gore reddening his jaws. So kind of eye and clear of gaze is that sweet beast that door need never shut nor window bar on him. But look, look there, one morning damp and dim in thick gray fog, or even while the slim and gaily tigering shadows creep on by the porch furniture on hot noons, see him advancing through the streets with monstrous cry, half plea, half threat, dying in huff of flame. This must be some new beast. As parents spy safe from behind parked cars, he damps his roar. It is the little children he is making for. When elders not looking at each other, creep out of their hiding places. Little men, little women stare back. Resentment deep inside their throats at what had always been a great place for the kids. Infants asleep and growing. Boys and girls, all, all eaten, burned by the prickly heat of baby throbbing, already urging scratching hands. The sobbing after certain hot hurts in childhood, stabbing pulses and flashing floods of summer that leap out in the dusk of childhood at youth, dabbing at the old wounds from which fresh feelings seep. Oh, help me, I am being done, the bobbing hip and awakened leg one day from heap of melting body call. Done? No, undone. Robbing the grove of first fruits, the beast feeds again. Burning is being consumed by flaming beasts, rebellious and unappeasable. The wind of very early morning, finally, casts a cool, sweet, quenching draft on hunger's end, those ashes and whitened bones. Each day, to lists of dead and sorely wounded are assigned the tasks of memory. Mute crowds push by the useless cages and restraining high, but not retaining, walls. Against the sky, only these ruins show at dawn, like masts useless in ships becalmed, but hung with dry corpses, or like unheeded fruit that blasts high in trees wasted. Menacing, wild of eye, the city, having missed its spring, now feasts nastily on itself. Jackals attend the offal, and new cities raven and distend. The whole story. I have Mr. Holmes's authority for saying that the whole story concerning the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant will be given to the public. There is at least one reader who will understand.
Dr. Watson in The Adventure of the Veiled Lodger. Where the beach hooks white, flat, around the end of the point, the spit of rock trails on the gray-green roiling water, and only there, there, too hard to climb to, sits the lighthouse. We cannot see any birds there, and we must suppose that the politician is doing something with the cormorant inside the dark, low room stuffed just below the tip, from which the poking finger accuses, in the night time, everything. No one can know everything, or even what goes on inside such places. Is there anything peculiar there? And what was the cormorant trained to do? Later, the air still faintly heavy, the sky bone white and fiercer than ever, the little dark green door at the foot of the creamy tower opens to allow the man in the broadcloth suit to emerge, wiping his hands on a piece of nasty cloth and looking up at the slowly growing violet of the sky. His collar is open, but at this distance we cannot begin to guess what may be occurring to him, or even whether or not he will stand there until it gets too dark to see him. Jefferson Valley. The tops of the spruces here have always done ragged things to the skies arranged behind them like slates at twilight. And the morning sun has marked out trees and hedgerows and defined them in various greens until toward night they blur back into one rough palisade again, furred thick with dusk. No wind we know can stir this olive blackness that surrounds us when it becomes the boundary of what we know by limiting the edge of what we see. When sunlight shows several spruces in a row, to know the green of a particular tree means disbelief in darkness, and the lack of a singular green is what we mean by black. Overcast. Bear alder and twiggy locust on our hill scumble about a steep track by the fence that ends in ruined pasture, cold and still. Often up here, the false gray light invents astonishing gray pastures to betray even our most primitive ways of knowing one branch from the sky behind it or a spray of yarrow from the rocky outcrop growing behind it. Seasons, too, destroy the real distinctions between what things appear to be. Is stripping this hilltop, though, of gray to peel from the trees their appearance of identity, or to show that what we feel is, after all, most real because it is most general? A theory of waves. Having no surface of its own, the pond, under the shifting gray contingency of morning mists, extends even beyond the swamp beside it, until presently the thinning air declares itself to be no longer water. And the pond itself is still for a moment, and no longer air. Then waking bass glide from their sandy shelf, and sets of concentric circles everywhere expand through some imaginary thing whose existence must be assumed, until they meet, when incorporeal ripples, ring on ring, disturb a real surface, as if with dripping feet some dark hypothesis had made retreat. A theory of measure. We draw our own dimensions. After all the yardsticks are outlawed, still, in secrecy, our shadows at evening tell us that we're tall. We know that hours ripen, drop, and fall without a clock to pluck them hurriedly. 
We draw our own dimensions, after all, almost as frantically. It may appall us that we are much older when we see our shadows at evening. Tell us that we're tall, and we wonder what in us you think is small, remembering doodles that sometimes, nervously, we draw. Our own dimensions, after all, may be asserted somewhere in the scrawl. That we are shorter than our poplar tree, our shadows at evening tell us. That we are tall, the fifteen-year-old marks upon the wall, our shorter friends, both show us constantly. We draw our own dimensions, after all our shadows at evening tell us that we're tall. The Fable of the Bears in Winter I once saw, weeping in a wood, the bears that break the heart of God, when dusty grapes hung from the trees revealed themselves as hosts of bees and rose toward the pale winter sun. It was most swift and sweetly done. They left their nests untenanted, but had they sallied forth or fled? For standing in a ring below, all the bears wept to see them go. Cold winter is a secret season. Frost and the wind confound the reason, perplexing every dying bee. But it is the bears I weep to see. When winter and the cold increase, he aims or sine, shield their peace. Some shall eat humble bee bread, some feed on the sumptuous honeycomb, but none may come to feel or see holy sweets in the wintering tree. For once, to keep a secret from the bears, less fortunate than some, God fixed it with a wild device, tight and impressively in ice, still shaking feverishly and sunny, trapped like a fly in amber honey. And to protect that shivering dancer, padlocks were put upon the answer, so that the secrecy was sure. It was both golden and secure. Warm bears, with fears as deep as ours, can take delight in trees and flowers, and the bees' business near and far, and all their gold ambrosia. But wet bears, with no wits to measure, cannot encompass such a treasure, nor the assumption of the bees soft enfold those mysteries. This final token of belief falls to the worst and shiftiest thief. He traffics in ridiculous things, spots and scraps and wires and strings. The dark suggestions of the winter urge the bad bird to pause and enter. Let jackdaw, magpie, crane, or jay enter then to rest and pray. They never let their foul affairs breach the deep slumber of the bears who once stood whispering in a ring, now warm and innocent till spring each wrapped in a brown indifferent bun. The bears, the bears, cruelly undone by birds with eyes so cold and bright who come and cheat them in the night. The bears, the bears, watch how the frost leads dreams of golden gifts now lost into their anxious hearts and deep among the silver gifts of sleep, the while the real adventurer succeeds by being bald of fur. The sleeping bear is sweet to see, but look you now, how easily the daw, the jaybird, or the egret picks the lock and breaks the secret. When all of them ran off laughing. When all of them ran off laughing over the dunes and up along the high spine of the island, three miles back home, through tangles of brush and the sweeps of broom, green broom. Silent winds three miles above us blew white clouds away from the sun, and all the beach gleamed. Cries of the flying gulls dispersed into the lapping of the tired water. From above, the cove must have seemed a shallow horseshoe opening out toward the variable sea implying all that possibility lying outside it. 
From where we were, it showed only its idiotically blank, bright face, and we were suddenly really alone, and even the sheep who had wandered almost to the beach's edge before had vanished over the green hill. Going inside the cottage was sillier even than staying out here in the first place. The old newspapers, piled on the sighing and faded bedspreads, were recent enough to be sinister, and the wind rattled the windows, and dark grey sand lay like dust in the bottoms of pieces of white cracked ironware lying on corners of tables in dimming rooms. Before we knew it, the water had gloomed into grey. Inside, the light was very, very faint. Outside, it was less dark, though it might have been night, and we waited twenty minutes more to be picked up, staring across at the boat, silently plying toward us. And even then, at last, they had to shout three times, as if across three miles of silences, before the water sloshing cold and dead about our ankles, we finally contrived to move into the chilling, sad September night. The Sundial When in the festival of August heat the air stops throbbing over the balustrades bordering the terrazzo, and for a moment the white pilasters on the older wing no longer mixed with the rough pink of the wall, regain the cold demeanor of their marble. A second of stillness halts the processional of hours on the heels of hotter hours, winding their turn and counter-turn and stand. While the great concrete lions on the steps seem always at the moment of fidgeting, and the house cats are no less motionless, their tails on the verge of twitching, never now, but always the following second. Then servants clamor for the city. Rifts in the masonry appear to be much wider than we had ever thought them. Tufts of grass thrust out through the cracked base of the sundial, and wilting morning glory menaces its bronzed, ingenuous face with blurring shadows. Only then, can we feel the sudden storm to be overdue for the fraction of an instant? For the dark wind is upon us then. The heat fractures like concrete, mirrored in the sky by the thinnest of cracks across the clouds, and followed by the expectedly delayed report that is always graver than we care to think, rumbling out of the darkness. Then both the sundial and the bird bath run over into the lawn, and bubbling puddles drip down the steps. Neglected by a wall, two marble putti weep as they are bathed, still leering through the rusty stains about their mouths. The ruin and the summer house are empty, but through the trumpeting downpour somewhere inside long windows, Leopoldine is playing her gratis ad parnassum, while nearby a Chinese philosopher on a silk screen shrinks from the thunder he has always held to be the ultimate disorder, as the wind wrinkles a painted heron on the bank, barely suggested behind him. The hour of storm goes by unmarked, but when the lowering sun hangs over the afternoon, making gold veins in all the marble again, revealing crystals in the carpeted lawns, when the air is clear and cool with a new stillness, the girls emerge from the house with laughter and teacups. The youngest stands on a swing in the oldest elm, facing her visitor from the city, who is tall and thin in black clothes, and they swing back and forth like a slow clock. Only then does the cool shadow on the sundial show the elapsed time of a distant age, the drip of water from its sharp, ostensive finger, still falling at ever slower intervals, dropping, the swing slowing, dropping. I cannot but wonder what you meant last month, when, recounting for us an old hour of storm, you invoked implausible landscapes, as you said, 
We had a quarrel once, and after the quarrel he left, and I went home and wept, and then, still weeping, I played ping-pong with my sisters. And your weeping echoed from another Europe, of houses to which we would never be invited, the girls in long white dresses, and the game disconsolate enough to last an hour while the storm raged on outside the draperies, spattering the terrace, while the sundial said nothing, remembering everything as the rain slowly eroded its features. When such heat sends us fleeing from the city, pursues, and then gives up its chase, the thunder blows the retreating blasts, and leaves us then stranded in another time, outside some city, Dublin or St. Petersburg, Salzburg or Prague, with no trains and the roads impassably muddy, and we are confronted with our own dream entire, with the side of the image we never see, the sundial in darkness, or cracked from its base and lying in one of the cellars, numbering storm-tossed hours, but telling nothing, until, before the image dissolves, we can see the marble house, the park, the filmy girls, standing and swinging in silence, the unambiguous shadow on the sundial, cast by the last glance of departing sunlight, measuring always this moment. Late August on the Lido. To lie on these beaches for another summer would not become them at all. And yet the water and her sands will suffer when, in the fall, these golden children will be taken from her. It is not the gold they bring. Enough of that has shown in the water for ages and in the bright theater of Venice at their backs, but the final stages of all those afternoons when they played and sat and waited for a beckoning wind to blow them back over the water again are scenes most necessary to this ocean. What actors then will play when these disperse from the sand below them? All this is over until perhaps next spring this last afternoon must be pleasing. Europe, Europe is over, but they lie here still, while the wind, increasing, sands teeth, sands eyes, sands taste, sands everything. Off Marblehead A woeful silence following in our wash fills the thick fearful roominess, blanketing bird noise and ocean splash. Thus, always soundlessly rounding the point, we go gliding by dippy, quizzical cormorants. One black maneuver moving them all at once, they turn their beaks to windward then, and snubbing the gulls on the rocks behind them, point black, a gang of needles against the gray dial sky as if some knowledge, some certainty, could now be read therefrom. And if we feel that the meter may melt, those thin necks droop, numbers vanish from the horizon when we turn our heads to scribble the reading down on salty, curled, dried pages. It is merely our wearied belief, our strained and ruining grasp of what we assume that blurs our eyes and blears the scene that surrounds us. Tears of spray, the long luffs reflex flapping, crazy with pain, and the clenching sheet, and looming up, great misery, named for whose, when, island, groaning, jangling in irons, crews of gulls still man a rolling buoy not marked on our charts. Overhead the light, impartial, general, urging of no new course, spares no approving brightening for the sparse and sorry gains of one we hold to now, ever doubting our memory. 
But no matter, whether running before the wind away for home, or beating against the end of patience toward its coastline, still the movement is foolishly close to one of flight, the thick, oily clouds undissolving, crowds of seabirds, senseless, shrill, unappeased, no boats about, and out to sea a sickening, desperate stretch of unending dark. on the sandbar. The sun, descending in an alarming fan of orange fire, burnishing the lagoon, and blazing bronze and green in cool waves, combed for a moment across my eyes, and picked out in some craft over beyond the point a sheet of burning glass. And as blindness burnt out like a fading match in seconds, Vision rekindled, inflamed our knowledge of sky and bare beach as we began to swim in from the boat to shore, which began to seem much more a shore remembered than a scene we perceived directly. Then as the ebbing tide crawled out, we were gasping, thrown up on the sandy widening margin. Down the beach a little, sandpipers were fussily strutting, and leaving fragile marks for the dying sunlight to fossilize, while black, half-buried, pocked as by some disease, a nearby spider crab's long basking rock of a body and dreadful stalk of leg were preserved in view, as if shadows, cool and petrifyingly abrupt, were to roll along the sand one moment after, glacially making it immortal. We sat thereby, considering how the land and sea divided literally, how each weaned strange creatures from the other's lap and ringed its dominion with scraps of natural history. So to be chronicled rather seemed not to remain imprisoned in bony sand, but somehow to outlast it. Then roared syllables shrilled as, cold, I called her, and then, as if to preserve that word, I took the crusty monster by the long leg and broke it off, flinging the body far and blazoned her name on the sand with it. Just after, as if some scholarly bore had shown us how conventional my theme was, the sun expanding prior to its last dive, windy beginnings of darkness gathering, we saw a wave come in and erase her name. A throwback to an earlier tide It came across that shallow record, washing out the resounding marks in silence. One day I dug my initials in a bench, but came the wind and rain, and they lay, intense, intact, perhaps entire still, while he who had seemed to live in them had died and had been replaced by another. So do we evolve like some weird sea creatures who secrete from time to time a new self, madly demanding at moments, chances to wear our current names in the rocks on which we wait for cold and eroding night to reach across the kingdom of the present, ending it, emptying it completely. Race Rock Light Over sparkling and green water, the lighthouse seems smaller than what the sun, pouring about our cupped, shading hands, should contract it to. And glaring reflections, splashed off the top of the bright bay just at noon, are like guarding pulses that cut visions to size, adjust shapes of images, lest they seem to matter too much in fresh sunlight, shining across prospects of summer shores' middle distances. Set out on a lump of wet rock, a commonly ugly house, mansarded and squat, affronts any view of the bay. Crowded inside a space far too small to surround it, the unlikely house carries, stuck in its roof, a lantern, just as if any fool knew a house plus a light equals a lighthouse. Eyes, minds, and voices surmount ignorant bodies and crowd out on top just as oddly, though. Remembering times one got close to there in a boat, 
straining against the cold wind at sundown to see what he could see, one feels puzzled over the keepers living there in a house at sea. Lighthouse keeping is like gardening here, inside narrow confines of rock, water, and sky. The sod growing thick in the perfect first of gardens was never churned harder than the alarmed sound in the rake of harsh squalls, and Adam could earn paradise as he served no more wisely and well than those who were planted here to tend garden, beacon, and house. Reddening now, and proud past enduring, that house looks at the sundown hour even more like the scene of that original dying dream, where those beautiful first children are taking turns playing being two bad parents, the sunset fast making green all the shadows, picking out in the window glass children's faces who wait deep in neglect for rain pouring down on the yard, sending the two ungarbed figures into the house once more where shadows are always brown. Their light housekeeping doomed always to leave each room, house, or garden, or land messier than the last, finally ending with such a place as this one toward evening. Shut into houses that keep whatever gardens they need locked inside their own walls, herded on rocks that force heavy currents to race on by, at least for a while, we make all our moments of light justify the despised houses, holding aloft lenses that turn toward shores ranged behind them in darkness, leaving them with a dying mark. For both of you, the divorce being final. We cannot celebrate with doleful music the old gold panoplies that are so great to sit and watch. But on the other hand, to command the nasal crumhorns to be silent, the tromba marina to wail, to have the man unlatch the tailgate on his cart, permitting the sackbutt player to extend his slide and go to work on whimpering divisions. For us to help prepare the mask itself, rigging machinery to collapse the household just at the end, rehearsing urchins who will trip all gilded into the master bedroom and strip the sheets, is finally to confess that what we lack are rituals adequate to things like this. We tell some anxious friends, basta, they know what they're doing. Others, whom we dislike, and who, like queens, betray never a trace of uneasiness, we play with. No, it could never work, my dears, from the start. We all knew that. Yes, there's the boy to think of, and so on. Everyone makes us nervous. Then, for a dark instant, as in your unlit foyer at sundown, bringing a parcel, we see you both and stifle the awkward question, what, are you here? Not because it has been asked before by others meeting underground, but simply because we cannot now know which of you should answer, or even which of you we asked. We wait for something to happen in the brown shadows around us. Surely there is missing a tinkle of cymbals to strike up the dirge and some kind of sounding brass to follow it some hideous and embarrassing gimmick which would help us all behave less civilly and more gently, who mistook civility so long for lack of gentleness. And since weeping's a thing we can no longer manage, we must needs leave you to the law's directive. You have unmade your bed, now lie about it. Quickly now, which of you will keep the lares, which the penates? and opening the door, we turn, like guilty children, mutter something, and hide in the twilight street. Along the river the sky is purpling, and signs flash out and on to beckon the darkness. The time is now. What time? What time? Who stops to look in time, ever? Ever. We can do nothing again for both of you together. And if I burn an epithalamium six years old to prove 
that what we learn is in some way a function of what we forget. I know that I should never mention it to anyone. When men do in the sunny plaza what they did only in dusky corners before, the sunset comes as no benison. The assuring license of the June night goes unobserved. The lights across the river are brighter than the stars. The water is black and motionless. Whatever has happened to all of us, it is too late for something else ever to happen now. Aristotle to Phyllis. This chair I trusted, lass, and I looted the leaves of my own sense and of clerks' learning, lessened the distance towards the end of my allotted eyesight over dull treatises on reason and sensuality, learning very little about what can still happen on a summer morning. Faint sea breezes, when felt too far inland, sometimes smack bone deep, bruise marine depths, somersault into a flood of sick sea longing. You walked past the window where my writing desk stands thick and oaken, jammed against the mullioned lights, and where a pitch pine litters all my work with fragrance once too often. If all beauty is scale and order, well then, the old man is unbeautiful in outraging his age, that should be past all dancing, playing all too well the infidel sage, unwilling even to gamble on a final life that is no sleep. And this being so, a simple country matter can be so urgent, and a piece of tumble, bubbly breasts, and trollopy lurch can matter so much. So little can be said for you, except that you're alive. But such a question, with a right wind freshening from the sea, blows back and forth across the mind. The bright emphatic mosses furring the cracks along the garden wall, trembling in the touch of breeze and blurring the surface of the masonry, fill all the sight. But still, trained in restraint and reared in reason, I sit at my desk, half in death, and staring down at a wide papyrus, silenced, blanched, and deafened to please for eloquence, its face pale with long darkness. Some other age must smash its last defense. We're no historians. What's past has faded, died, and lingers no more. And only its remains appear in patchworks of quotation, as in all the fussy, fretted centos that I have assembled from the poets. Even here, and you must get the scribe who reads you this to show them all to you, the tessellated lines of one whose greatest voyages involved the vessel from which he dipped pale ink of an exotic nature appear. But in my language all these sink into an earthier journey. A few swift rounds under the evergreens outside, the fur and box hedge hiding us, clouds peering in the pool to view gardens reflected, and the yews along the wall waving green encouraging brushes. Come, Phyllis, come. The miles I have been saving are for your traveling. Only in middle age did Maiden Argon amount to anything. Come away, pass the mead again, and gathering your thick skirts bellyward, lean back and lead me, simpering, outside into the garden. There, as you throw up your leg to climb astride my back, I'll dutifully munch the bit. Then bottom to bottom will the no-backed beast run duly peripatetic at each mossy garden corner. Giddy up, good doctor. If by chance the static and pungent waters of the garden pool reveal our natures to our eyes, it's all part of the party, eh? Stammering, balanced, the master of those who know, old staggerer, not bearing a chubby, giggling slut merely, but rather like some fabled, prudent beast that bears with it its water, nutriment or home, will carry then the bed he'll soon board. Underneath a tent of cherried branches ripening fast, I'll put you to the plow and turn your furrows up, and spring, spring will envelop all the air. From far across the wall, a scent of distant pines will fall, even as now it drops across my writing desk, full of reports of distant life, 
and hopes regained, and projects floated on an unnavigable future. And whether there will be a fated sea fight tomorrow, exploding, showering results on the ignoring water, or merely a plodding and serious fool about to quarrel with a colleague over what once I might have meant, devout enough, both of them, although never having learned the tongue I write in, cannot be told now. But at the brink of the moment, mad, mad for its coming, our knowledge quickens, ripping at the garment that cloaks the truth that will be. Let's get on with it, the game in which the master turns the silly ass, straining for breath, arousing the outraged gales of what should have been a season of calm weather. By the Sea Joe macht die Musik von damals nach. The dark, grey, receding tide uncovers new reaches of white sand, and underfoot dry bony driftwood moves into the shade, growing as cold as the sparrow-coloured cliffs that hover above the beach to mark the rooted boundaries beyond all which nothing made of the sea may pass. The flying onshore winds only flap through an awning over the empty beach house. The sun becomes paler than one could believe. The treachery of memory is probably no deeper now than it is ever. But when, toward evening, summer shivers into covering darkness, spreading no particular season's chill down the beach, older, remembered images invade the prospect. Like the preposterous youngsters who come prancing over the sand, waiting for sundown on the hard, cold beach to send them groping for each other's furry parts in the blackness of sandy blankets, handling the loneliness, the only angst each has ever known, in the only ways occurring to them. We ourselves expend passion on peeping, at seascapes, perhaps, or on grabbing a feel of this night air nearly as nervously as they. Their rubbish found at morning in pools among the rocks manages somehow to hold a simple bare innocence always. White floating relics of hurried ceremonies looking fairly like the dead blowfish that meander around them, remaining harmless, while all the horrid nonsense of moments we have left behind drifts up onto the shores of consciousness and waits to betray us. Even this stark scene, robbed of its being by other beaches, winds, sunsets, tides, our own touches of darkness, senseless, gauche, and inconsiderate gifts given us by what once we were, and baited with what in all traps seems most attractive, even this strange new beach becomes, beclouded by unforgetting eyes, one of the good old places. And the roaring of the sand's edge, tunditur unda, thundering under high loud breakers, blasting the uneven tides of silence, alternating with windy pianissimi that whimper through the cold, sighing to cadence, is quickly cuddled by pampering recollection, in whose embrace all the wild music is drowned in the old song with the embarrassing title that is lodged deep in our hearing. All its heaving, precious, banal progressions work toward damping everything that purports to be musical. The stodgiest tune will have its aftermath when, once forgotten, or like the gods of a place one has been banished from, remembered in all despite of better judgment, always remaining, like the flapping of the wind, tumbling of breakers, the gray turns braying, somehow prior to other singing. Faced with waves, surrounded by sand, tangled in tall bundles of crab grass, we are marooned in strains and chords of habit because of having faced other beaches, if only remembered faintly as being dreamt of, mediating between us and the scene before us, fading softly to dark. The Great Bear Even on clear nights, 
lead the most supple children out onto hilltops, and by no means will they make it out. Neither the gruff round image from a remembered page, nor the uncertain finger tracing that image out, can manage to mark the lines of what ought to be there, passing through certain bounding stars, until the whole massive expanse of bear appears swinging across the ecliptic. And although the littlest ones say nothing, others respond, making us thankful in varying degrees for what we would have shown them. There it is. I see it now. Even, very like a bear, would make us grateful. Because there is no bear, we blame our memory of the picture. Trudging up the dark, starlit path, stooping to clutch an anxious hand, perhaps the outline faded then. Perhaps could we have retained the thing in mind ourselves, with it we might have staged something convincing. We easily forget the huge, clear, homely dipper that is such an event to reckon with an object set across the space the bear should occupy. But even so, the trouble lies in pointing at any stars, for one's own finger aims always elsewhere. The man beside one seems never to get the point. No, the bright star just above my fingertip. The star, if any, that he sees beyond one's finger will never be the intended one. To bring another's eye to bear in such a fashion on any single star seems to require something very like a constellation that both habitually see at night. Not in the stars themselves, but in among their scatter, perhaps. Some old familiar sight is always there to take a bearing from. And if the smallest child of all should cry out on the wet black grass because he sees nothing but stars, though claiming that there is some bear not there that frightens him, we need only reflect that we ourselves have need of what is fearful, being really nothing, with which to find our way about the path that leads back down the hill again, and with which to enable the older children standing by us to follow what we mean by this star, that one, or the other one beyond it. But what of the tiny scared ones? Such a bear, who needs it? We can always still make do with both the dipper that we always knew was there and the bright, simple shapes that suddenly emerge on certain nights. To understand the signs that stars compose, we need depend only on stars that are entirely there and the apparent space between them. There never need be lines between them, puzzling our sense of what is what. What a star does is never to surprise us, as it covers the center of its patch of darkness, sparkling always, a point in one of many figures. One solitary star would be quite useless, a frigid conjecture, true but trifling. And any single sign is meaningless if unnecessary. Crab, bull, and ram, or frosty, irregular polygons of our own devising, or finally, the great dark bear that we can never quite believe is there. Having the others, any one of them can be dispensed with. The bear, of all of them, is somehow most like any one taken at random, in that we always tend to say that just because it might be there, because some ancients really traced it out, a broken and complicated line webbing bright stars and fainter ones together, because a bear habitually appeared, then even by day it is for us a thing that should be there. We should not want to train ourselves to see it. The world is everything that happens to be true. The stars at night seem to suggest the shapes of what might be. If it were best even to have it there, such a great bear, all hung with stars, there still would be no bear.